Hi, Seth. Hello, Serge. Good morning. So, so maybe to to talk a little bit about who you are, I start with a question. How come somebody who's a psychologist, who trained a lot of psychologists, is now a Zen minister and very preoccupied with philosophy, all kinds of philosophical approaches to life? Well, that's a really good question. And let's let's feel our way into it and, and explore it a bit. I, I discovered uh, Buddhist practice and Buddhism maybe about 20 years, 10, 15, 20 years into my practicing as a psychologist. Um, when I came across a TV program of um, on PBS about that, that, that filmed a segment on John Kabat-Zinn teaching meditation to chronic pain patients. And at the time I had a fair number of chronic pain patients I was treated treating and I was using biofeedback and hypnosis and a variety of other methods to try to treat it and was never really very satisfied with it. And when I saw this film, it was a Bill Moyers program called The Healing of the Mind that featured John Kabat-Zinn. And I watched him talking to these chronic pain patients as they were meditating. It kind of woke up some seed in me that had been planted many, many years ago. When I was an undergraduate, um, a fellow by the name of Alan Watts came to our school and stayed for about a week and gave a series of lectures uh, on Zen and related topics. And I was absolutely fascinated by what he had to say. And for a while, I was very much taken with it. Say at the age of 18, I was reading everything I could on Buddhism that existed back in the 1960s, which wasn't a great deal. Yeah. But it was like a kind of a book stand Buddhism. There wasn't any way to go with it. There weren't any teachers nearby. There, were, um, there wasn't a sangha or community I could belong to. So it just became a kind of an intellectual thing. And, and at the time, even at 18, I thought of myself as a Buddhist at that point, but it really never went anywhere. Um, and then as I completed my graduate studies in psychology or as I started a family, all that receded into the background. It became kind of my past. And I think in watching Kabat-Zinn doing this work, it, it kind of reawakened that, oh, I remember what that was all about. Uh, and that was really important to me at one point. And is there a way I can integrate that into what I'm doing now? So, so I asked uh, the people at Kabat-Zinn's um, uh, center over at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center in Worcester, I asked them if I do an internship with them. And they said, yeah, you can do an internship, but first, you have to have had a meditation practice that's at least a year old daily meditation practice. And you have to have been on at least one 10 day silent Buddhist meditation retreat. Uh, and so I said, okay. <laughs> so that, that's kind of how I got started. Uh, and then once I had done that, I figured I needed a Buddhist teacher. So I went to a conference um, in the late 1990s in Boston called the first conference on Buddhism in America. And I heard teachers from all different varieties of schools give Dharma talks, and I was able to talk with them. And I picked out a couple of people I thought it would be great to study with. Um, one was Larry Rosenberg, who runs the Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts Insight Meditation Center. And the other is Tony Packer, who, uh, the late Tony Packer, he used to run the Springwater Center. So I did lots of retreats with them and with, with a lot of the Insight Meditation people. Uh, some some Tibetan teachers. Um, anyway, so that was that was the beginning of practice, and I and I remember sitting there on my first ten day retreat with a teacher, late teacher, whose name was Ruth Dennison at the time. And I remember listening to her Dharma talks, and I'm and I'm going, hmm, that's really kind of what I already believe, you know. Except I've never really articulated in that way before, so. I found myself immediately at home. And the first time I sat down to meditate uh, with the, with the uh, John Kepitzins group, I immediately said, this is something I want for the rest of my life. It just felt so extraordinary to me. And I found it life-changing for me in all kinds of ways. I, um, I found it added to my, my ability to be immediately present with myself and with other people, to be more present in my body, be more embodied. Um, they were just to be, it made it made it more possible for me to be able to get in contact with the felt sense 
instead of thinking about things in my head all the time, understanding what the wisdom of the body is all about. I mean, these are really tremendous changes. And as I continue to practice, though, I also found myself in, at dissonance with a lot of the ideas in Buddhism. I mean, many of them I agreed with, but many I didn't. And so teachers would say various things, and I'd go, wait a minute, do I really believe that? And um, at some point along this journey, I had joined a philosophy group, a book reading group, over at my local library. And the very first book we read was Aristotle's, uh, uh, Aristotle's Ethics. And it was another extraordinary approach to looking at the ethical life, besides the Buddhist approach. It had a lot in common with it, but some differences. And, and that intrigued me. So, so I wrote this book a couple of years ago called Buddhism and Human Flourishing, which compared Aristotle's path with the Buddhist path and tried to integrate them in some way that really kind of aligned with what I thought was true. And then in subsequent years, I, I began studying Chinese. Uh, as a Zen priest, you, you, you come across a lot of writings that are based in Chinese writings. I wanted to be able to read them for myself. And so I started studying, and then that led to studying Confucius. And all of a sudden I said, here's another kindred person like Aristotle and like the Buddha. He's interested in the same sorts of questions. Um, he's interested in an ethical revolution and within his own time. And uh, isn't it interesting to see how these three systems have some commonalities between them, but also differences. And so just intellectually, I was interested in kind of understanding the similarities and differences between these systems. And then coming to the conclusion, which is not a, you know, a lot of people read all the philosophers and they read Spinoza and Hume and Nietzsche and everybody else. And they say, well, who's right? Who's right? And, and the point is none of them are right, <laughs> but they all offer some different vision, okay, that we can take something from and can enrich our lives in some kind of way. And I thought, well, yeah, I mean, we don't want to necessarily be ancient Buddhists or ancient Confucians or ancient Aristotelians, but maybe there's stuff we can get from all of that that's valuable for us to carry forward in a new way today. Maybe not the way they exactly meant it, but the way that resonates for us today. So that's been my focus. How do we, how do how can I take the things that I've learned on, the, on these three different journeys, four different, different, if you include psychology as well, how, how can you take those and come up with something new that might be relevant to the way we live today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. You used uh, the phrase when you were talking about Confucius, um, talking about him as a kindred spirit or another kindred spirit. And mm -hmm. what strikes me when you describe your journey is essentially you finding kindred spirits uh, who express maybe better than you would have something that already is in you and helps you develop it. And then a sense of having a conversation with these kindred spirits um, that exactly. is informs exactly. the way you practice life. And also there's a kind of otherness to them as well. I mean, there's a kind of alterity. There's, there's a way in which, because they're ancient figures from a different culture and a different time, they think differently about things than we do today. And that's valuable too, to say, hey, the way we think about things maybe isn't always the right way to do it. You yeah. know, maybe somebody else had some vision too that's worthwhile appropriating in some kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So maybe somebody had better ideas, had a vision, but you also mention of how uh, that quest started with a sense of the limitations of, or your own, um, you know, critical concepts about Buddhism saying, oh, I love a lot of things and there's some things that I question. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I must have listened to thousands of talks from teachers over the last 25, 30 years. And there's probably not a single talk I ever heard or hardly a single talk I ever heard where I agreed with everything the teacher said. <laughs> My mind is always going, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Is that true? How do I feel about that? So there's constant chatter that goes in the mind as you hear this. And yes, I think there's plenty to criticize about. I mean, first of all, there isn't one Buddhism. There are many, many different Buddhisms, both historically and culturally over the years, and they don't all agree on very much. Um, but, but if you think about some of the main things that most of the schools agree on, there, there are points that I disagree with very rigorously. Uh, 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 um, they have a lot to do with the idea of the perfectibility of human beings and their ability to transcend their basic natures. And I think there are real limitations on how much we can change ourselves, how much we can be different from ourselves. And, and plus, there are things about that final vision of what, what well-being is 
that don't strike me as well-being. If you're talking about giving up all attachments or all desires, mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing very attractive to me about that. I, I want a vision that enlarges human possibilities, human life, and doesn't uh, help people by subtracting from them. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that sense of an engaged dialogue, mm -hmm. um, and and that sense of expanding from there. So we're not talking about finding, um, you know, some kind of um, sameness in all the traditions, even though there may be a lot of sameness, mm -hmm. but actually um, engaging in a dialogue that focuses on both similarities and differences. Um, mm -hmm. as a way to helping you and helping all of us figure out how to manage being in the world. A absolutely, absolutely. And even the differences between the systems are intriguing. You can say, well, how come Aristotle stresses courage so much, Andrea, courage? And how come the other traditions don't mention it at all as a major virtue? Or how come... Uh, Plato talks so much about justice as being a crucial virtue, and justice is never mentioned in the Buddhist tradition uh, as a, as a as a as a kind of a concept. I mean, there are times when the Buddha tells kings to share their wealth with the people and make sure everyone's you know well fed and safe and so forth. And there's a sense of karmic justice, right? There's a universal justice in that sense. People get their just desserts, but nowhere does the Buddha ever talk about justice. Yeah, uh, how come? And, and these differences between the systems are intriguing. What, what does it say about the cultures they came from or the particular blinders they had within that culture and so on? Yeah, or what problems were more um, apparent and required more attention? Well, it's interesting. For, for example, if you take courage, and Aristotle takes military courage as mm -hmm. his kind of exemplar of that, these were all people who lived in war-torn eras where war was a constant. Yeah, and uh, the the, the, uh, the local um, Indian cultures, um, the Chinese cultures. This is Confucius is writing during the Warring States period in China, which is probably the bloodiest part of Chinese history. And certainly, you know, Athens is involved in the Peloponnesian Wars and all the other wars that they're involved with. The wars against Persia. Um, how come it only strikes Aristotle that it's important to talk about this, and and yet? Confucius doesn't mention it at all, although it's it's implicit in some ways. You know, when 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 you think about the unerring Confucian scholar who is always doing what he thinks is right, that means he has to resist all these pressures, but he's going to get to do what's wrong. So there has to be some kind of courage yeah. that this person has, but it's not. It's never explicit in quite the way it is in Aristotle. Yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, there is an implicit quality of courage. And so um, in looking at the different systems, um, maybe more of the various virtues are present, but under different appearances, as you point out, doing the right thing is something that's impossible to do without courage. Mm -hmm. um, so how does this, how does it fit for you, for all of us as a modern person, reading these various systems and discovering one thing or another, being present here, being missing there? Well, you can ask the question, if you'd like to, how many virtues are there? You know, And the point is that it's an indeterminate list. That, they, that I could list everything that I think of as a virtue, and you can say, well, how come you left that out? Or how come that's on the list? I don't think that belongs there. And so there's a constant process of, of collective inquiry about what are the virtues that are relevant for us today in this world, in the society. And you never it's not as if you ever come up with a definitive list. So you can say things like equanimity and courage and uh, kindness and compassion. We can say those are virtues for us today, and they're meaningful ones, and we, we can make a list of other ones as well, um, conscientiousness and so forth. Uh, and we can come up with a theory about why they're virtues. In, interesting enough, Aristotle ne never makes up a theory about why his virtues are virtues. Hmm. He, these are just things that the people in the aristocracy of his day seem to think are important, so he mentions them. 
But it's also possible to come up with a theory about what makes something a virtue, some kind of vision of what human flourishing is, what it means to live the best possible life. And then what are the habits or states of mind or attributes that, um, that contribute to successfully living that kind of life and achieving the kind of goals that you want in life. And so we can call those skills, certain set of skills in living are virtues for us, but they're virtues because of the fact that they, they contribute to flourishing or they're part of our, um, our image of flourishing itself. Yeah. So the, so the, the discussion of uh, virtues is within a context, mm -hmm. which is what is it that actually is going to favor human flourishing, both on an individual level and at the level of society. And exactly. the things that help favor flourishing are going to be virtues and those that don't are not. Exactly. And with the understanding that every society is different and the kinds of virtues that lead to well-being within that society and what's possible for people in terms of well-being are going to be different so that a warrior society and an honor society and a hunter-gatherer society, for example, may have very different sets of virtues that enable you to live well than, say, you know, large industrial democracies. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, uh, an invitation to notice how virtues are rooted in history and sociology. Mm -hmm. and um, And so to both find some kind of a nurture in seeing something that's been there for a long time, respected as a virtue, but also a sense of um, paying attention to how it fits within the context of how we live today. Right. And things that may be a virtue at one point may not be a virtue at another point. So that requires constant inquiry into, does, is this still part of flourishing? Is it still meaningful for flourishing in this time and era? Yeah. Yeah. And so almost um, as a virtue itself is the notion of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would I would say that, you know, just as Aristotle listed moral and intellectual virtues, and today we might call that virtue and wisdom, we might separate them into two baskets, but they're not really. I would say that the ability to maintain an attitude of open inquiry into values is part of what constitutes wisdom today. Yeah. And it's really it's really the endeavor that, say, Socrates was engaged in when he was asking, what is justice? He's he understands that in the past, in the Homeric era, you know, virtue meant one thing. And here in this later era where we have all the great dramatists and comedians and so forth writing and well, maybe these things mean something different today in these in these modern societies, modern in Socrates' time. And yeah. he, inquires, he inquires of everyone, what is justice? And everyone comes up with a slightly different answer. And and the 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 uh, the end point of this is not that there is no such thing as justice, but that its meaning is slippery in some kind of way, that there's always a new way to understand it and uh, given a new context. Yes, so so very much um, a sense that the practice of living uh, is a practice of inquiry, mm -hmm. and with the idea that. Um, while we make conclusions to live from moment to moment, uh, this is also a practice that never ends. That's right. There's no discernible end to it whatsoever. And that, that's, what I, see, that's what I didn't like about my old ideas of Buddhism, that there was a path and you reach the end of it. I don't think there's an end. There's just always more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's always more to understand and more to appreciate and more ways to grow. There is no end to history and therefore mm -hmm. keep changing. Yeah. Yeah. And no end to the ways we may change over a lifetime in the way we understand things. Yeah. And I think it's an exciting vision. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the way you're uh, describing it, the way you have lived it, uh, is a mixture of uh, inquiry at a personal level of contemplative inquiry, mm -hmm. uh, but also an intellectual inquiry. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I would say... Uh, personally being a therapist, that being a therapist is also another way of inquiring because it's a way of testing, in a way, um, the theories with what happens with other people as well. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that the theories are just theories, they're not truths. Right. And, and when you have a real patient in front of you, you know, confronted with a real life situation, a real life problem, is they may not fit any theories. It may be something brand new that hasn't been seen before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this attitude is an attitude of being open, of being curious and open, mm -hmm. um, feeling relatively safe to uh, not be so fragile when contradictions happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's obviously not too widely shared in the societies in which we live. So how do we adapt to having that ideal in a way that we cannot find kindred spirits in every other human being we encounter? Well, you know, I call my book, um, the, the subtitle of my book is Virtue, Wisdom, and Pluralism. Mm -hmm. And I think the next thing I want to emphasize is the idea of pluralism, that we don't live in a world where we all see things the same way and we all agree on things. And that's, that's as obvious today as it's ever been. Um, and yet somehow we have to navigate being in the world where people have very different worldviews and different, different ideologies and different, very different beliefs about what the good life constitutes. Um, and, and to me, the heart of liberalism, as, as I understand it, is a willingness to, if not celebrate, at least tolerate these differences and say they have a right to exist because there isn't any kind of one way to get the world right, you know. Uh, but the question is, can people with different worldviews live together in, in some kind of compatible way? And we have examples of that here in the United States. We have, for example, the Amish who uh, don't believe in driving motor cars and so forth and, and don't believe in having all these newfangled devices. And they... They live all throughout the Northeast in their own communities, and they don't insist that everybody else drive buggies. You know, it's, it's okay for them if they live their life, but they don't insist anyone else live their life. Or we can look at the Orthodox Jews, you know, here in various communities in New York, where for the most part, they live their own lives. They don't go on the internet. You know, they don't, there are all kinds of things that they won't do. They, they go to their schools and they don't learn the kinds of things that we learn in terms of um, mathematics and science and so forth. And yet they're, con they're, for the most part, content within their own communities, and they don't insist that everybody else follow their educational model. You know, they say, well, this is the way we live, but we can, we can live in this society. Occasionally there are clashes over who controls the school system and so forth, you know, as more and more Orthodox move into a, a community. Um, but for the most part, you know, we manage to live together. And the question is, can that be a model? Mormons, for example, you know, had a difficulty fitting in with the United States. They believed in plural marriage to begin with. There was a question about whether Utah would be admitted to the Union or not. They reached some kind of compromise on this. Not every Mormon follows that. You know, there's still Mormons who follow the old ways. But somehow Mormons managed to live in society and do well, even though most people aren't Mormons. We have all kinds of examples of people with different beliefs getting along reasonably well together. Um, so the question is, when does that being able to live together in relative peace, uh, when is that contract shattered, you know, uh, and it's shattered mostly when some group decides that everybody else has to follow the, the way that they live, when they deny the idea of pluralism. So, so I think it's important that we teach that in schools and families and elsewhere, this idea of plural, pluralistic tolerance. Mm -hmm. that, um, so so I, to, to put it another way, mm -hmm. uh, uh, talking about how values uh, that are important are related to what society there is. As we live in a society where there are a lot of different cultures, mm -hmm. uh, the importance of pluralism is even more important. And so we're talking about um, uh, the teaching of pluralism not as some abstraction, but as some kind of embodied way of living, mm -hmm. is the the oil that uh, you know that makes the machine work better. Yes, just just from a practical point of view, absolutely. Yeah. But also from a philosophical point of view, I, I mean, I think um, I always think about Isaiah Berlin in this regard, who is the the British philosopher who said that all the goals that we aspire to in life don't form a unified, unified whole that being, say, a successful businessman might not totally 
be coherent with being a good family man or being a spiritual person. I mean, we have all kinds of things we aspire to in our lives and we make trade-offs between them in various ways. And different people will come up to different conclusions about how to trade off, you know, uh, uh, how much quality is needed versus how much uh, liberty is needed and so forth. These are all values that clash. Um, and so we always have to make compromises in some way between them and, and, and accepting that that's really the way life is and that people are different, naturally different people are going to see things differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's just an important lesson in how to live life with other people. Yeah, or, or with oneself, essentially, because when we're talking about conflicts, you were mentioning the Isaiah Berlin concept of goals may be different in, and uh, contradictory. So we are in conflict with different parts of ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, there's different people, different cultures, different perspectives clashing in society. And essentially, we come to that notion of an acceptance of the inevitability of conflict. Mm -hmm. So right. almost uh, coming back to, you know, that first noble truth of the inevitability of suffering and replacing it with the concept of the inevitability of conflict mm -hmm. and finding a way to actually deal with the inevitable existence of conflict. That's right. Well said. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> say it better. Yeah. There, there's another... Um, major teaching in all this for me as I'm looking at Confucius and Aristotle and the Buddha, and that is that none of them believes in the kind of individualism that we tend to believe in nowadays in society. Um, we have this view that's kind of slowly formed over the last 500 years in the West. Um, and part of that's just the history of the Renaissance and the uh, Age of Reason and the Protestant Reformation and the Romantic Era and all these different ages that contributed to who we are. But there's a sense of us as individuals who, as John Locke said, uh, kind of uh, got together to agree to form society as if it was a social contract. And whenever I heard that, I always say, well, nobody ever asked me <laughs> whether I wanted to agree or not. Uh, and the fact is that we don't agree to form communities or countries and nations. We are born into them. We're born into families. You know, it's just human nature to be part of social organizations. There's no place where that's not true. And so we have to, as Aristotle said, we're not only rational animals, but social animals. And I think that all, all the, uh, you know, Buddha certainly emphasizes the interconnectedness, interconnectedness of everything, that we're not separate from the environment, we're not separate from culture, we're not separate from anything, we were all effect, interaffecting each other constantly. And Confucius had this very, very rich social vision about how the family and the state and the individual and morality for all three of them are deeply intertwined. And um, I, I think we've gone too far in one direction here in the West in terms of looking at individual liberty and our separateness as the most important thing. Uh, and that we have to kind of swing back a little bit, not to lose what we've gained in this, because there are good things about individualism. The idea of having inalienable rights or having the right to express ourselves. I mean, these are all good things. But we also have to realize that there, there are limits, that we live as part of an organism, so to speak. And what we do has to contribute to everyone's well-being, not just our own. Otherwise, um, otherwise, life becomes, as Hobbes said, nasty, brutish, and short. So I just think about, for example, the fact that um, Australians are also somewhat of a Western society, but are much more socially minded, that Australians uh, died, the, the death rate was one-tenth the American death rate during COVID because Australians wore their damn masks, you know. They didn't think it's my right not to wear a mask. And it's the same thing in all the Confucian societies in Taiwan and Japan and Vietnam and um, Korea and so forth. I mean, they all, everyone got vaccinated, everyone wore their masks, and they were able to keep the death rate much lower than we did here. Uh, and there are many, many other examples you can give, but certainly in, in East Asia and other places in the world, people have a much more sense of being an integral part of communities and not just being kind of lone wolves who are kind of occasionally agreeing to be together. Yeah, yeah. So I think and, we need to do something that, I mean, I mean, the Chinese go too far in the other direction in terms of a collective understanding of, of well-being. And we're too far in the, in the individualistic side, but there's some place maybe where we can, you know, reach a synthesis between these yeah, yeah. And so as 
an individual, you know, thinking of it in terms of how can I put this more into my embodied understanding of life? Mm. Um, you know, how do we do that? I mean, certainly the experience of meditation helps go beyond the experience of a limited self. I'm just wondering how we can strengthen that a little more and um, find practices in life that help us remember that there's more to us than being an isolated unit. Mm. What a good question. Um, the um, it's it's related to another question. I'm just let's put it this way: uh, the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor asked the question. Uh, Gee, we we have our loyalty to our immediate family and our kin, or our tribe, and, and we, then we have a more general sense that. We should have goodwill for all mankind in some kind of way. But there's a clash between these two. And, and kind of when times are flush and there's, and there's plenty and there's no shortages, we can be very generous to everybody. And then when we're under adversity or hardship or scarcity, all of a sudden we circle the wagons and, you know, my tribe or my family first. So there's a real disconnection in terms of our a natural understanding of what it means to care about other people. Um, and... And then we can ask, are there resources within the moral repertoire of a culture that enable us to transcend that? Okay, so for example, in Christianity, you have the parable of the Good Samaritan as an example, but we can probably look at every culture and they have examples of what it means to help someone. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, 29 times, I think it says uh, to love the stranger, mm -hmm. not love your neighbor, but love the stranger, you know. Um, so there are moral resources that we can rely on, or stories we can rely on, but there's also, I think, some inner feeling that you either have or you don't have about these sorts of things. You know, I, I can remember, you think about what Albert Schweitzer talks about in terms of um, the kind of, uh, I'm trying to remember what his phrase is, but the, the idea of the, the love of all creation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sanctity of life, that's the one he uses. Or... Um, you can think about John Dewey and when he writes about natu natural piety, which is a kind of a kind of an awe at life and and nature and everything else and a feeling connected to it in some kind of meaningful way. And I've certainly had experiences on retreat where I just feel this overwhelming love for everything I come across. You know, I take a walk after having meditated for a couple of days and I, I would just want to cry because everything looks so beautiful and I feel so much outpouring of love for it and, you know, not just people, but trees and rocks and clouds and, and everything. It's an amazing experience. And I think if you have some experience like that, it becomes a ground that you can always have within you that says, wait a minute, every, everybody matters. Everything matters. You know, it's our job in life to take care of the of everything that falls within the little circle of our life and make it better in some kind of way. Um, and, and that includes inanimate objects as well as, you know, people and animals and plants and so forth. We try yeah. to keep our house neat and our bed made and all those things. So it's something I feel very deeply, you know, that um, this is my, my living responsibility in terms of everything that I meet and encounter in life to somehow improve the situation, not just for me, but for the other as well. But, but if you don't have that naturally, if you're if you're feeling about life is more life is dog eat dog competition and uh, morality is for saps and just get the most you can for yourself and whoever has the most toys at the end dies and when he dies wins. If you have that kind of philosophy, then I don't know how you get from there to a more uh, compassionate understanding of the, the suffering of all beings. Yeah, well, I think there's probably in some cases it's impossible, but in the middle, uh, what you're outlining is essentially a practice of giving ourselves an experience, an, an opportunity to see the world in a different way. 
So you were talking about the fact that when everything goes well, it's easier to be generous with others. And when things get tighter, then, you know, we kind of tighten up and don't want to give. But the experience of actually noticing how good it feels to open up uh, and feel part of something larger, uh, if it's not experienced as some kind of a punishment, you have to do this, you know, you have to deprive yourself of what you have, but as a chance for an enrichment, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes actually something that helps expand for most of us uh, the possibility of, of, of feeling some joy and connection. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think that's true. It feels right to me. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting um, uh, there's a contemporary Chinese scholar by the name of Tao Jiang and he looks at all the different hundred schools of philosophy during the warring states period in China in not only Confucianism but Taoism and Moism and legalism and all these different schools of thought and he says is there a central issue around which they all revolve and the answer is yes it's 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 the question of uh, selfish, selfish or uh, self-referential love for you and your family and your kin versus what do you owe in the way of justice to everybody? And they were struggling with that issue. Every one of these philosophies came up with a different answer to that question, but they're really all debating each other about it. And you see the same question in, in Greek tragedy at this time, like in the story of Antigone where she, her brother is left unburied by King Creon and she has to decide whether to listen to the king and obey him and leave her brother unburied or whether to take the body and privately bury it uh, because she owes that to her brother against the king's decree. There's that question about family morality versus the larger society morality. And there's a way of thinking about the way societies were organizing at that time that that became a central problem for people, that when you're in small little hunter-gatherer societies, that wasn't such a big issue. But as soon as you establish administrative straits, states and uh, bureaucratic structures that are somewhat far away from us, the Chinese say, you know, the sky is high and the emperor is far away. <laughs> as, as soon as you begin establishing something like that, then there's an immediate conflict about what do you owe to whom. And it's, I, I think it's something we human beings have been struggling with since, you know, 2,500 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So we come back to that notion of dealing with conflict as essentially part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for example, there's there are, there are examples in Confucian philosophy about what happens if a king has a father who breaks the law. Okay, does filial piety demand that you protect your father, or does being the king and the administrator of just land demand that you put your father, you know, in jail for that? And the different Confucian philosophers came up with different answers to that. Con Confucius believed you never harm your father. My God, that's the worst offense ever against, against heaven. Whereas Mencius said, no, no, there's a real conflict here. What you have to do is you have to quit being king. You abdicate. And then you take your father and you run away to another country and protect him. <laughs> but they, they all had different answers for, you know, what do you owe to different, different parts of your life? It's an interesting question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 So the notion of different answers, and maybe that's a good place to stop. Just want to see if you want to add something, or if we uh, end on that notion of um, it's impossible to not have different answers to the various challenges of life, and uh, and the sense of um, um, dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. There is one other place I want to go, um, and that's I think what you said is just right. And there's a practical problem of what do you do when different parts of society cannot agree? Mm -hmm. And when does that disagreement, when is it tolerable and when does it become intolerable? And when it becomes intolerable, when are you allowed to resort to force, for example, instead of persuasion in a situation like that? I mean, we had that problem during the Civil War where um, people found slavery intolerable. Okay, and we're willing to tolerate that. Oh, well, let some states be slave and some states be free. Okay, and we're reaching similar kinds of problems like that around questions like abortion, for example, or other kinds of questions. Um, and certainly the um, division between, say, the, the, the uh, Make America Great Again wing of the Republican Party 
and the rest of society is, is, is that kind of gulf right now, where perceptions are so different about what's right and fair, um, that we're almost at the same brink we were at the Civil War. Uh, and, and people don't talk about a civil war like we had in the 1860s. We have large armies amassed at each other's borders, but it's certainly an era where there'll be guerrilla actions and lone wolf actions and terrorist actions uh, going on. And the question is, how do, you, how do you deal with these kinds of terrible divides? I mean, our goal is to avoid these kind of conflicts as much as possible, but that as much as possible has an asterisk next to it, which is that things aren't always possible. And when when is the resort to force actually okay? Um, so I think I think that's another very very live question. That's one we always have to be inquiring into. Um, we'd like to keep the peace. This I, I think for me the the uh, the most immediate answer to that is that we have to have the ability to see each other as people, regardless of our differences, uh, and realize that people have in many ways more in common than they have. Difference, so that, for example, the um, the very right wing Republicans I know may also be very good at raising their kids and educating them and earning their living, and they might be honest in their business affairs and so forth. And that it doesn't make you a corrupt human being all around, you know, to just disagree on a whole variety of important political points. Uh, we probably all have common ideas about what it means to be a good neighbor. In other words, to if your neighbor is sick, help them get to the doctor or don't play your music too loud at night. We all have some common understandings of things, even though we disagree about uh, gun ownership and abortion and uh, um, how, how to deal with transsexuality and homosexuality and uh, what role should women have. We disagree on very important issues. And we also understand that if we let people just, if we let someone in another state run things that they want to, if, we let Mississippi be Mississippi, so to speak. We also know that there are people we care about in Mississippi, uh, who, of course, the kindred spirits of ours in some kind of way, who are being harmed by all this in very palpable ways. And how much of that do you tolerate? And how much of that do you just say, well, it can't be helped? So I think, I think these are very live questions for all of us. And I'm not giving any answers to them. I'm just saying, this is what we live with right now. And uh, we have to keep on we have to keep on inquiring we have to keep on trying our best to talk with other people and not to them okay i, I think uh, one of the most valuable things i learned as i was on this journey of writing this book was the idea that our job is not to change other people's minds about their values but first of all to explain to them that we hear what their concerns are we understand why they think the way they do and if we don't we ought to make the effort to do that and then second, after we've explained to the other person why we understand what they do in a way that they can say, yes, you heard me, okay, then you can go on and say, and I'd like to explain to you why I see things differently, not why you were wrong and why I'm right. But let's talk about the fact that we do have different visions and isn't that interesting? And let's, let's explore it together. That's a very hard thing for people to do because values is what people are invested in the most and don't want to explore. <laughs> They're just God-given things for a lot of people. But but I think that's the route we have to go, is finding a way to talk to, to, with each other rather than at each other in some kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, um, to somebody who has a different set of values, mm -hmm. embodying the attitude, I see you, I want to see you, mm -hmm. in a way that you experience being seen by me, mm -hmm. and I'd like to have an opportunity to share with you how I feel, so you can possibly see me as well. Right, and also explain why I see things differently. Why don't Why don't I see things the way you do? What What are my reasons? How did I get to where I am? There's a story behind it, a narrative. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and this is no different. I'm not just sticking to a point, but I want to understand not just the point, but the point through your experience. I want to understand why mm -hmm. you believe the way you do, and I would like you to understand not just my ideas, but actually how they are, why they are important to me and how I... That's right. That's right. And, and maybe you'll end up not agreeing with me, but maybe understanding, well, it's possible to have a different view and yeah. still be a decent human being, you know, which is a remarkable agreement that we, it's very hard for us to reach. And this is really the same thing that, you know, uh, a therapist like Marsha Linehan says about how to talk to borderline patients who are cutting themselves. 
You don't just say, cut it out. <laughs> but you say to the person, I understand why cutting is so important to you and why it seems almost impossible for you to live a life without doing it. And I also think it'll be impossible for you to have a better life for yourself or a life worth living unless you stop doing it. But you have to, you have to combine both points of view to get anywhere with a patient. <laughs>